Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom McIntyre, and I'm the Director of External Affairs here at NYU Washington, DC. Uh, we are pleased to welcome a guest lecturer at NYU Buenos Aires and former LA Times and Washington Post staff writer, Santiago O'Donnell. Um, Santiago is currently working as the foreign editor um, of Pagina 12? Is that? Pagina. Pagina, sorry. <laughs> uh, newspaper in Argentina, and as director of the journalism master's program at Universidad uh, de Buenos Aires, uh, Santiago is the author of Argent Leaks, um, a book that he'll discuss further this evening. Uh, joining Santiago is NYU DC uh, academic writer special writing specialist and first year uh, liberal studies lecturer Alicia Gleason. Uh, Alicia earned her MFA in creative writing um, in fiction from George Mason University, uh, where she was a teaching fellow. Uh, her fiction was awarded an honorable mention for the uh, Shelley A. Marshall Fiction Contest and has appeared in uh, Cleaver Magazine and Oblong. Uh, prior to NYUDC, Alicia has taught writing um, and literature classes at George Washington University and George Mason University. Uh, please welcome them to the stage. Hi. Thanks so much for being here. Um, I'm um, a reporter, like they were saying. I used to work here at the LA Times and the Washington Post. And then um, I, um, a brother of mine had an accident, so I went home to Argentina to be with him. And I realized I learned so much about journalism here that I wanted to take some back to Argentina and start working. And after a few years, I'm a foreign editor for the last five years. I, I used when I went back, the first thing I did was investigative reporting because I wanted to honor the, the Washington Post tradition. But I drifted into several jobs and finished being ended up what I'm doing now. And as a foreign editor, I sort of ran into this stuff, which is what I came here to talk about, that is uh, the big leaks and how they're changing journalism. Um, how, how did I run into them? Well, first, Assange uh, picked me. Uh, to have some of the first um, documents about Argentina after he got into a fight with the big five media and started distributing it lo uh, locally all over the world, but very, you know, still like keeping the exclusive to some journalists and some media. He, he ended up, and, and I, well, I know it's one of Alicia's questions that she's going to bring up, but. He changed his tactics several times in terms of dealing with the media. But I ended up really interested in his work. And we hit it off because um, I, I interviewed him very long interviews. And, and it, it had a lot of repercussion in Latin America. So even though he get mad at me for asking him things he didn't want to talk about, and he'd stay mad for several months because he's very sort of a um, uh, control freak. Uh, we ended, we always ended up doing more and more until one day he even agreed to let me spend Christmas with him and write a story that's called uh, Christmas with Assange. That was the first time he opened up and talked about what it really meant to be uh, locked up in a in a four bedroom apartment in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, uh, fearing that you're going to be shot at if you get close to a window and not seeing the light and not having fresh air for six years. Um, so anyway, I had a lot of work with him. And through that, when uh, the Panama Papers came to Argentina, the paper that published it and the journalists got into some credibility problems. Uh, and so they asked me to look at the papers and report on them because they thought that was the best way that people would believe in the papers. Basically, what had happened is that with the Panama, um, with the uh, WikiLeaks, a lot of the stuff that um, that I discovered, the papers didn't want to run. First, my paper, and then when it became public, all the other newspapers. So I wrote this book that Alicia was talking about, called Argen Leaks, that became a huge bestseller. Um, because I published there the stuff that the newspapers didn't want to publish, which were 
first and foremost, everything that had to do with the media, with media moguls, with big shot journalists, etc., going to the embassy and, and kissing up to the ambassador or, or lobbying for some American product or, or, or doing something maybe not too, too nice for at least uh, the authors of the cables to report that, for example, Clarín, which is the main, the major uh, dominant media group in Argentina, did lousy journalism but was excellent to do business with. So this and then other stuff about the AMIA bombing that was a terrorist attack that was very, very relevant geopolitically because it's the only terrorist attack outside uh, the Middle East that's attributed to Iran and Hezbollah. Um, since all the last ones from 9-11 on have all been done by Sunni groups like, like the Islamic State and, and like ISIS, uh, this, this terrorist attack, if it could be proven that it was done by the Iranians, it was very important to the Israeli, the conservative Israeli government led by uh, Netanyahu and Lieberman and also to the Republican right and its allies in the United States. So this was a big deal, uh, a big sort of state secret that also I, I printed in my book and it had a lot of explosive information that, that went back and forth as, as the newspapers followed the governments that shifted positions on these things. But anyway, the book really proved that the, the key prosecutor in the case was receiving instructions from the U.S. government to only investigate the Iranians and to not do any other uh, investigations outside the Iranians, do not investigate the Syrians, do not investigate the local connections and so forth because it weakened U.S. foreign position. So this truly made the trial bias. So it was a big scandal when my book came out and, and showed this and showed how, for example, every single judicial uh, act that the that the prosecutor did or that the judge on the case did was anticipated to the U.S. government and the U.S. government would say, okay, do it or don't do it. So it was a big, big scandal. Basically, so I ran into this, then I ran into the Panama Papers. I also wrote a book and in the book I was able to show how the newspaper that was supposedly divulging information about the Panama Paper itself had a huge offshore operation in the Bahamas and the Cayman Islands and so forth. So what it was denouncing, it was triply guilty of. And that's, you know, what a position it put its own reporter who couldn't really report on its own paper's problems, but um, did a lot of reporting almost that went contrary to what the owners wanted him to do in terms of revealing things that they didn't want to reveal, especially about their advertisers and so forth, right? This whole idea when, when the Panama Papers came out, it was like, oh, this is the rich and famous doing these naughty things, when actually it's everything you do when you wake up, the, the, what you eat for breakfast, the laptops you work on, those are the guys that have the money in the fiscal havens, not just the celebrity, right? It's Apple, it's Macintosh, it's Doyle, it's... Uh, uh, your farmers' uh, insurance is every every big firm that you know of, and um, and then of course the big debate on the Panama Papers, where they were very successful as closing up uh, the ones in Panama and and in and in the Caribbean. In case of the Panama Papers, in case of the Paradise Papers, all the big tax havens in the British Commonwealth, both around the British Islands and in Asia and in Africa. And then, of, of course, in the HSBC papers, uh, a lot of damage uh, to China and to Switzerland. So you end up thinking, well, are they like really starting to clean up on fiscal heavens? Or is this just a good ploy to help U.S. fiscal heavens? And until we hear about uh, Delaware papers or Nevada papers, or Wyoming papers, I think we'll still have that doubt. So almost incidentally, I started becoming um, an expert on, on, on big leaks and started to reflect on them and to think about them. And the more I thought about them, the more I realized that they're more and more like the wars that we're fighting. You know, like we don't have 
big armies anymore fighting any wars. And uh, we have mostly drones killing people. But more and more, the big wars are wars about information. Just like in the previous century, the wars were about conquering natural resources and fighting for oil rich countries and so forth. More, and this, of course, was a pattern from, from I would say, if at least the, the Middle Ages or even before when people were conquering ports and, and places that were strategically important to their economies. Now the wars are fought over databases, over information. And that's why I'm convinced that big leaks are the atomic bombs of the new wars that are fought over information. And just to give you an example, if you own 100 oil wells and I own, have all the keys to your bank accounts, you know, why do I need the oil wells? All I need is the numbers, you know, just empty your bank account and I have all the wealth that your oil wells produce. So more and more what you want to know is information and and, and in these big wars, and I think this is almost a tragedy for people like Edward Snowden, for Chelsea Manning, uh, for, for Julian Assange, who um, uh, it really is interesting to know the history of them, and they're not, they're not the caricatures both their supporters and their critics make them out to be. You know, they're not these traitors, and they're not these innocent people. Uh, I think they understand as well as anybody who analyzes and looks at at the situation is that is that no player and, and when I talk about players and and and, and I have a, a class I teach in Buenos Aires NYU and I hope you can all come it's called leaks and whistleblowers where we analyze the different players you know you have on the one hand you have the leaker right on the other extreme, you have the victim, right? And in the middle, you have first tier that I would call intermediaries. That would be somebody like a WikiLeaks, an organization that is dedicated to publishing uh, information and protecting informants. Or the Consortium for International J Investigative Journalists, which is responsible for the Swiss leaks and the Panama Papers and the Paradise Papers. Uh, which is a, another NGO, this time based in the U.S., with a lot of funding from George Soros Foundation uh, that sort of uh, distributed what is the biggest leak in terms of documents in the world right now, which was the Panama Papers. You have other leaks that go to the media outlets without intermediation, like the Snowden leak that went to the, the Guardian mostly, even though the... Washington Post and the China News uh, Daily published some, some information as well. But what's interesting about the Guardian, that even though it is a media organization, it's a very unique one that has uh, sort of nonprofit funding and nonprofit status and is run by a board of trustees that doesn't interfere into its editorial line. And it's certainly not a US outlet, so it's not really very close to any of the main actors here that are China, Russia, and the US. So even though it is a news outlet, it's also very unique. It comes to show you that the big leaks, sort of the traditional media, aren't always the best, uh, uh, the best uh, outlets for them. They're just like in the third stage, which is the media. And the media is very interesting because some, some of the big leaks are done by two or three newspapers, others by dozens, some by a few hundred. But in all the cases, the media has its own interests, which, which conflicts a lot with the intermediary, as you can tell from the, the bitter break uh, between the Assange and WikiLeaks and the, the five big media that reported Cablegate. It's always a tense, difficult relation between the intermediary and the media, but so is between the media and the reporters, because there's, there's another category there that is really important, because it's not the same if the reporter is a company man who just looks after the interests of his newspaper, or he's willing to take a lot of risk and, and willing to put a lot of his professional capital in the line and, and really go and tell stories, that even if they can embarrass their own media, or especially, as most often the case, uh, embarrass or 
go against the editorial line that that particular media has with a determined government well, or with the op uh, say it's pro government or pro opposition and the, the leak hits one of their allies you know or the other case of course is more and more as you know the newspapers are having trouble financing themselves all the classified ads have gone to the internet uh, the number of advertisers has shrunk a lot so they're more and more dependent of the few advertisers they have left. So again, a story like uh, the Panama Papers that has a lot of business information and that can hit top advertisers of the newspaper is also another uh, line of tension between the reporters and, and the media. So, so you have all of these different actors that, that are playing in, in, in pulling the the, the, these big leaks in different directions. So one thing that you can see is that the leaks, even though they have their main targets and they're not politically neutral, they're also very difficult to control and a lot of times when they explode, they explode in different directions. Well, wh what do I mean this? I, I think it's very important to say and to, exp and to repeat that these big leaks are not politically neutral. Uh, geopolitically speaking. Now, what does this mean? It means that, for example, the, the first two leaks, uh, the Snowden and the Cablegate leaks, were considered by the U.S. intelligence operations, uh, masterminded either by China or by Russia to hurt the United States. And there were clear statements uh, uh, linking uh, Snowden and the WikiLeaks organization to uh, some of these world, uh, to these world powers. So basically they were saying, oh, they're hitting us with these big leaks. What happened with the Panama Papers? The Panama Papers are almost the uh, opposite. There are practically no U.S. officials or U.S. businesses in them, but they are uh, very um, revealing about corruption in President, uh, Chinese President uh, Xi Jinping's inner circle and also in President Putin's inner circle. So not surprisingly, this time it was Russia and China who claimed, oh, this is the United States, an uh, intelligence operation masterminded by the United States to hurt us, and this is all uh, propaganda and so forth. So it's very interesting, again, to look at these big leaks in the context of the big war around them. You know, just, just, just to get you some context, uh, 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 Cablegate started in 2001. I think it was uh, 2008, 2009, the U.S. syntax uh, uh, virus uh, that was used against the Ire Iranian uh, um, nuclear program. And this uh, was supposedly a virus that delayed for a couple of years the development of the, of the Iranian nuclear plant. So if this were a I mean, I, don't want, I know the game didn't start there, but this is one move that you can say, then came the retaliation from Cablegate. And, and then if what happens in the year 2012 between Cablegate and Assange? If you remember the headlines of the, uh, a lot of the newspapers here in, um, in the US uh, showed that uh, there was big concern about Chinese companies hacking uh, the U.S. government and the main uh, U.S. corporations, and there was all this investigative work done by the New York Times especially, but also the Washington Post, showing how these, uh, there was all, all sort of how they tracked down to a city in northern China where the Red Army operated and the, the whole thing led to there. So in the meeting in Hawaii that, that she and, and, Tr and, and Obama had right after the Snowden revelations, had it not been for what Snowden sh showed, which was not just uh, mass spying in the US, but also US spying of Chinese university and of Chinese uh, text messages. Then the meeting in California, when the item of, of mass surveillance and spying and hacking came up, uh, she would have had to heard Obama's complaints and have nothing to answer. But in this case, it pretty much evened up the, the situation and quickly, quickly China wanted uh, uh, Snowden out of there and that's how he ended up in, in Russia uh, trying to come back in the US. But obviously, 
I think that the public opinion, and in this case simplifies the situation, it says that if the guy is in Russia, he must be on their side. And I think that him, his not being able to win that public opinion battle more than anything that has to do with the law here in the U.S., which, by the way, has really hardened on these kind of borderline cases between what you may call a whistleblower or a traitor to the U.S. or, or a hero or a threat to national security or whichever side of the divide you want to be in. Uh, it's, been, it's got a lot harder from Daniel Ellsberg, uh, Pentagon Papers times, and Ellsberg himself would and has recommended both Assange and Snowden not to even come close to the U.S. because the uh, justice is a lot harder. You know, remember Chelsea Manning got something like 35 years that was later reduced by Obama's pardon to 12 years. So at least you can say that for Obama right now, treason uh, or being a confidential source or being a, a whistleblower, however you want to call it, is worth 10 years and 12 years in jail. Uh, I don't know how much that would be for Trump, but I would have to say at least twice as much. So I do have some questions about that. Sorry to interrupt, but no, 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 not um, at all. Can we can we uh, talk? Can we talk to about our hen leaks for a moment? Sure. I, yeah, I, I just wanted to. This is uh, well, you know you came in perfect because this I was just wrapping it up at that. You perfect. know, saying that this is this is where we are, where it's a very fine line between being a source and uh, a protected source and being a criminal. Yeah, absolutely. So I, so the book opens with your exchange of the pen drive with, with Assange, and that reads like a spy novel. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. yeah. So I've been asked to recreate that situation, <laughs> but it was true. I was, um, yeah. It was the beginning of, um, of, of my adventure into, you know, now to me, Assange, after having interviewed him six times and spent many, many hours with him, like he's not so much a myth anymore. But at that point, I was, basically what had happened is that after Cablegate, Assange, had, before Cablegate, or, or a few years back, he would never like publish, do anything with the media. Everything went to his website and got published by the website, and it never had the success that he felt it deserved. So once he gets this collateral murder video about the Reuters reporters being shot by uh, Iraqi helicopters a little bit before Cablegate, and he releases that in, in Google, and I'm sorry, YouTube, and it becomes such a success, he decides that for his diplomatic cable, he's going to make an alliance with the big media of the world. So he has The Guardian and Der Spiegel, the German magazine, and the New York Times already working with him. So he calls on the Spanish newspaper, Madrid-based El País, and France's Paris's Le Monde. And so he has his five big groups with which he disseminates and, and, and breaks the cable gate news. Now, what happens there it was a Mephistotelian pact because the, the media wanted to kill Assange because he was his adversary more than anything else, his competitor. And Assange at the same time wished these media wouldn't exist and he could do it directly. And why did he hate doing it through the media? Because he lost control of its edition. So now the media edited it and put it out the way they wanted it instead of the way Assange wanted it. So they, the, the alliance didn't last much. And then Assange realized that even with these newspapers doing as good a job as they did, there were like millions of cables, millions of countries that had been practically ignored. Because one thing is, you know, the New York and Washington audience, another thing is the worldwide audience. So we started handing out pen drives with that country's particular stories to individual journalists. And he started in Latin America, and he first went to a couple of reporters in Mexico called La Jornada, and then and then he gave some to a Colombian reporter who wrote uh, two, three paragraphs about it and really inspired me. And the third person, he gave them out to me. And at that time, he was with an ankle strap living in a castle called Ellingham Hall in the outskirts of, of the British uh, prairie out there in some place where some very rich and famous uh, journalists in, in, in Great Britain, who was sort of his follower, had let him the house. So 
So I was like, in this movie, really, I mean, I had no idea. One thing about Assange is that he was very paranoid even before he was the most spied guy in the world. I mean, when nobody knew him, he would go to demonstrations with, with, a, with a mask of anonymous, you know, and, and he would even put rocks in his shoes so that he would limp and people wouldn't recognize his stride. Now, that's how paranoid he was. So imagine when he became the most spied guy in the world, which is when I met him, how paranoid he was. So I was there with, and in the airplane, I was reading a story about how fashion had changed and how people started dressing like, like Assange, you know, with a big uh, uh, raincoat and a, and a turtleneck shirt and that kind of thing. And so I started thinking of this. And so the guy shows up, basically, the ones who, I, I, I show up in this train station, and I'm ready to wait, and then like a car comes up and two women pick me up. One of them is Sarah Harrison. The other one is a Guatemalan lawyer that's very close to, to the organization, but since she hasn't been officially named as part of it and this is all being filmed and so forth, I'll, I'll leave her name out. But basically, like I was there and they would give me the contract to sign and, and all of a sudden, Assange shows up with a, it was really, really cold. I mean, I had a, a jacket I bought in Chicago and it just wasn't making it, you know? <laughs> uh, and, and so so he comes up with a cup of tea and a couple of cookies and I pick up a cookie and I, cause he's, and I say, I wanna write about you. I, I wanna write about you. And he's like, no. Nah. So I pick up a cookie and I'm like, this is what I wanna write about, you know? And, and he was like, oh no, this is my work, not my life and so forth. But uh, what was really fun is that I figured, like, I got to give him a phrase where he will really at least know I'm here, you know? So I said, gee, you know, I remember when he used to be Che Guevara in the jungle with a rifle, and then came Commander Marcos, and he was still in the jungle, but with a laptop, and now it's you with a laptop, but instead of the jungle, in a castle, you know? I mean, you know, revolutionary change is getting shaker all the time. So he kind of laughed and thought that was, uh, you know, funny. And so I was able to engage him. And, and so they gave me this pen drive with, you know, I was, it was the beginning of pen drive history back then. Uh, all the later releases, you know, he would just send us by email encrypted mail from Tor. And, but this time he would give you physically the, and these were a million documents about Argentina nobody had ever seen. And I couldn't see him either because he would only give me the key to unlock them once I got to Buenos Aires. So I go to sleep in the, in the hotel, right? And, and I leave my jeans on and I leave them leave in the pocket of, of my, because I'm afraid like some Russian spy is going to come and, and put a Louis in my drink, you know? And I'm like, well, what if in the middle of the night I leave it on the drawer and the maid comes and says, I have to clean this room and s switch it. So, so bottom line, I slept all night with, uh, with uh, the, the pen drive in, in, in my, my jeans pockets and with the jeans on so that nothing would happen. And what's really funny is that I, I've told the story many times and for some reason it gets kinkier all the time because everybody's like, yeah, he slept with it in his underwear or something. I never mentioned underwear, but now in Argentina I'm the guy who slept with the pen driver in his underwear. <laughs> so, so anyway. So how did how did Argentinians receive the the book? What was the reception in Argentina? Yeah, it was it was a shock because what I did is I I and and you're you're a writer so you and this is the stuff you like but basically I came up with the idea of doing it alphabetically, yeah. and uh, and just like three different types of stories. One was just one cable. And what I did is take the cables and put them in context, right? Sort of like let the let the U.S. Um, uh, I mean, they're all signed by ambassadors, but they're not really who write them. They just sign them. So let's say let the U.S. diplomats write the book for me, and I sort of you know fill in the holes and 
So one of them was just like straight cables. The other one was like a whole series or a theme that maybe there were a string of 15 and 20 cables and I would curate them and say, you know, such year this was happening and then they changed. Like for example, the Monsanto cables that as you know is a very controversial, um, well my journalism teachers told me no, never use controversial, but a very, uh, uh, you know, uh, it had run into a lot of problems in uh, outside and inside the U.S. over the years. And, um, and uh, well, we had a lot of cables about how they were fighting to introduce their uh, genetically modified products in Argentina and all that kind of thing. So that probably was maybe 20 cables. And others were just like short series or two or three cables. Um, in my second book, I just used names. In the first book, I was still like honing the system, so I used some themes and some names. Um, and then Julian Assange picked up on it and he told me that he used my model to write his book that's called The World According to Empire, that instead of doing it alphabetically, he does it like by region, uh, and, and, and those are like sub-chapters uh, by countries of those regions. But, mm. but this whole idea of taking the cables and giving them context and giving them life, making them like the, you know, the, I always receive the advice is uh, follow the character. If you don't have a, the character will always lead you to the story. You know, if you don't have a character, you don't have a story. So almost using the ambassadors and uh, as characters or, or, or using the, the trying to bring life to the documents and make the documents themselves, you know, become, you know, just by uh, exploiting every little detail and angle and like how they call this guy with a lot of familiarity because he visited the embassy a lot and, the, you know, the little details. And so um, uh, the, the stories um, had a lot of impact because there was... What was really interesting about the cables is that it was like five stories into one. Because one story is like basically the truth about Argentina-U.S. relations, right? Because as you know, in Latin America, um, the U.S. government has a bad reputation. And Argentina, like worse than any other country except Venezuela and Cuba. So even though Argentines love Americans, they really hate U.S. government and feel it's very unfair. So there's a sort of underwater water diplomacy where they get along great, but the U.S. is used to getting criticized a lot publicly. So if you really want to understand how the governments really relate, you can't rely on public rhetoric. You have to read these cables. So that was a very interesting story that came out with a real relation uh, between the two governments. Another great story is like, how U.S. analysts saw what was happening in Argentina and, and, and in the region. So almost like take away there might be some sort of bias for being the U.S. There are a lot of topics in which the U.S. wasn't directly involved or didn't have an interest. So these U.S. cables gave you an idea of how Argentina was looked at or seen around the world because a lot of times even the U.S. Um, diplomats consulted diplomats from other countries and had some sort of consensus and so forth. So that was the second look, was how we were, Argentina was seen by the, abroad. Another one that was very, very interesting was how a lot of like, anybody who wanted to be a president would go to the US embassy and kiss the ring of the ambassador. And so there were Argentines who were seen as very patriotic and this was the part that people just really loved because it was very gossipy about how uh, supposedly proud journalists would go into the embassy and melt before the ambassador, uh, give up even his grandmother in order to, you know, please the American embassy or, 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 or advance any kind of interest that the U.S. embassy would see them. And that, that included, of course, spies, you know, because you could see in the cables they would say protect or strictly protect. And so you would see people who were considered very important, prestigious politicians turned by this book and this, the, this irrefutable book into like cronies and spies and snitches and, 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 and all sorts of things, right? So it was very interesting because, as you know, these cables were never denied. So, it wasn't like somebody saying it. It was like 
it had the authority almost of, of being science, of being true, you know, beyond any doubt, because it was something that was not written for the occasion. It was something that was supposed to have, have been kept secret forever, and all of a sudden you had the documentary proof, you know, that this guy hate, went into the embassy and started talking crap about the other minister. So there was a lot of treason, too, that was really fun, too. Like, who would go into the embassy and betray their government and say, publicly, I have to say this, but truly, you know, I'm a member of this government. But it's like, there's this guy who was the chief of staff who calls in 20 investors and a US representative to his office in the pink house. I mean, this is like the equivalent of being here in the White House and tells them not to invest in Argentina because the country sucks and they're just like in the government transitionally because they don't believe in it at all and they're gonna leave it soon and they don't invest in it. I mean, can you imagine that? I mean, even the ambassador was amazed and he would write, I can't believe this guy would do it in his own government house, you know? And what's really funny that instead of saying, what a terrible guy, of course, the conclusion from the ambassador is that this would make a great informant, you know, go look him up and get his information and try to bring him over as our new spy, you know, they love the guy. So, so that was another third level was sort of the human decay and, and you know, the, the, this whole thing of, of watching really powerful people in your country who you think are untouchable, all of a sudden, you know, just crawling on the floor in the embassy, you know, so, and then of course, uh, the other part that's really interesting is a look at the whole U.S. policy in the region, like the whole U.S. policy, even during Al-Qaeda, even after 9-11, uh, was always concentrated on Iran and Hezbollah, and they were clearly, and at the same time when China was becoming a, a big trade partner in the region and the U.S. was ignoring it completely, every, even time when Sunni militia were, were heading bombings all over, it was always like the big obsession with Hezbollah and Iran. Of course, the documents don't just go touch the beginning of the Obama uh, year, so they don't really get the part where the U.S. temporarily gets close to Iran and strikes the nuclear deal, or what happens now with Trump sort of bringing back the Iranians into like the forefront of his foreign policy. But so that was another aspect. So if you get all these layers, you know, uh, that's what I think made the book really attractive. So I'll ask one more question and then I'll open it up to you guys. So get yourselves ready. Um, so, so speaking about how these whistleblowers are treated, um, Jeff Sessions says that arresting Assange is a priority right now. And um, Pompeo says that he shouldn't have any First Amendment rights because he's not a US citizen. Uh, meanwhile, the ACLU says that this would set a, set a really dangerous precedent um, so that the Trump administration could maybe go after news organizations that aren't publishing things in their favor. Uh, as a journalist, what, what do you think? Well, first of all, you know, part of the reason I'm here is, is that um, I'm, on, I'm trying to create this uh, library or a library of, of whistleblowers here at NYU and try to get uh, all the testimony of, of uh, in the first place, Snowden's, but also then uh, Daniel Lalsberg and Chelsea Manning and, and Beauty and everybody who's, who's, who's done it to sort of hear why they do it and what they did and, and what they think their legacy is. Yesterday I, I was talking to Snowden's lawyer and he says that history tends to be kind to whistleblowers and not so kind to agencies that prosecute them. So we'll see. Uh, but basically, to answer your question, I think that Julian Assange's situation is really, is really amazing. And I was with him after the, um, after the Hillary uh, stories and after the Podesta leak and, and the DNC leak at a time when the Trump uh, campaign was very, very happy with him. Uh, this was after the election, so, so, uh, and, and he already was, I'm like, okay, now you're gonna get a break, right? And he was like, no, because I'm gonna go after Trump and I already have this stuff on him. And he released in Vault 7, which was a trove of CIA documents that uh, prompted these comments that you quoted. And, and I think that 
there's a huge irony that Julian Assange, who's perhaps, and, and what I said jokingly, I believe so in terms of impact in the world, I think he's the biggest icon for free speech right now in, in the history of the world. And yet he is the person, the person who has, I would argue with President Lula in Brazil, but that's just, to just I'll leave that aside, the person with less freedom of speech rights in the entire world. He has less freedom of speech, not only of you and me and everybody in this auditorium, but of even uh, uh, somebody on death row. He, a guy, a, a person on death row, and not just in the US, but in the most repressive regime in the world, maybe outside, uh, I would say, Saudi Arabia right now, uh, has anybody has more freedom of speech than him. And I think that he has this, he's a man of action who I admire the way he can theorize. I think he's very instinctive in everything he does, and then he sort of theorizes about it. But he's fought very hard for his independence, and regardless of what may, some people may accuse him of, of having uh, uh, a closer alignment to Russia than other countries, I've seen him not just criticize Russia and Putin, but release very damning documents against Russia. It's just that they don't, they don't get to play the documents get here or when anything happens in, in Washington or New York. But basically, even after he did this, right after he was in, in the embassy, he released the Syrian emails, which was a correspondence between the Syrian dictator and Russia's main ally, Hafez al-Assad, especially with his Russian backers. And then, and then after that, um, what's really amazing is that he took, I mean, it wasn't hard enough that he was already with a five-person organization, which obviously branches out to millions of people through different networks, but at its core, it's just five or six people who are not only taking on the Pentagon and the White House and, and the GACQ and all of London and Great Britain and at, at, at a certain point until it backed off Sweden. But he was then took on the entire European Union by defending the Catalonian independence. And he did it at a point where there had been a change of government in, in Ecuador, which was the country that was sponsor his ex exile. And, and, and the political conditions had changed drastically in Latin America, which was the continent that defended him. And he was at his most vulnerable moment. And he takes on the fight in Catalonia, which puts him against not just Spain, but the entire European Union, because just like Spain had Catalonia, uh, Great Britain had Scotland, and practically every country had a separatist region. So uh, by putting into question Spanish sovereignty, they were putting into question the sovereignty of nearly every country. So almost uh, in a suicidal way, he, he gets not only after the uh, criticizing one country and the other and the other, then then even Europe, you know, he gets, you know, as as a rival. So he's in in a very weak position. I heard that two days ago he got his computer rights restored, which I am so happy because for him it's almost like being free. It, I mean, he doesn't even care if he's in a cell as long as he has unlimited access to internet. But six months without internet already in a in a psychologic and, and, and psychiatric uh, situation and physical situation where he can ha barely move his arm. He needs to take painkillers all the time for a bad tooth because he, the Great Britain won't allow him to get treated uh, and, and not lose his rights. And, and basically his legal situation now is that he's wanted for skipping bail which is a charge that at the most is one year, but uh, which uh, one year is never a sentence that you spend in jail. And um, he's had um, at least, um, I mean, 99% of the cases it leaves with a fine. But what happens? The US may or may not have an unsealed indictment for uh, him and a grand jury waiting for him. And, and as you said, Pompeo and, and Trump has said they want him for treason, which is, uh, 35 years to life, so so uh, that's really 
uh, where he's at right now in a very vulnerable situation uh, which the United Nations has declared that he's been unlawfully detained. Okay, I want to open up to you guys um, and give you a chance to ask questions. Please wait for a microphone to come to you before before you ask. Hi. So first, thank you for being here. And you mentioned something about the Panama Papers before, and I personally remember that when that came out, I felt like it was an earth-shattering scandal. But at least in this country, within a few weeks, people had forgotten about it. And I don't know if that's because of the attention span of this country or because of other things happening, but there were very few repercussions here. So what do you think about that? Is that something about our country or is that something about the Panama Papers in general? Well, as I said, you know, this country, you have the, the biggest fiscal paradises in the world. I mean, it's easier to evade taxes in this country than in other, any other country in the world. And now with, uh, with, with the bad reputation going on the Caribbean and all the, the force of the law and all the attention there, um, then, then it's, you know, it's really strengthened the position of the financial community here, which certainly has no intention of listening about the Panama Papers. I have a Congress that has to do with, uh, with fiscal heavens and fighting corruption uh, next month, and it's in Nairobi, so it's not, it's not in the US. Uh, in Great Britain, it has had a huge impact. And being Great Britain, maybe the only media market that's important outside of Washington and, and New York in terms of, of generating news. Uh, and, and, and they, they, they voted, the parliament in a surprise session about three months ago voted to, to end the fiscal secret in Great Britain, which is a huge deal. Uh, but, but the problem is, um, it, as I said, if you look at, uh, because the US, the, the biggest US companies and the, the government officials or influential people, whoever, who evade taxes in the U.S. mostly do it in Nevada or in Delaware. Um, the the company that that sort of was hacked into it was a lawyer's company that creates these these fiscal havens uh, companies, these shell companies, um, was a Panamanian law firm, uh, whose most of its clients were in the British uh, Virgin Islands, and and in general. I mean, most of it's shell, shell companies, and its clientele was mostly Latin Americans. And on the one hand, there was a lot of information about a violinist who was uh, uh, Putin's best friend, and was, uh, and many think of him as his front man, and a lot of, of information about Chinese President Xi Jinping's inner circle. So in those countries, certainly uh, it had a great impact uh, the president of Pakistan, who was in the Panama Papers, also had to resign. The president of Iceland, the same thing. In Great Britain, John Major, the um, John Mayer, the the British Prime Minister, uh, it's true that he also lost the Brexit. Um, he lost the Brexit referendum, but along with that, the damage he suffered with the Panama Papers case was very big. There was a, a journalist also killed for. Uh, working on the Panama paper revelations in in Andorra, so there were all sorts of repercussions in the world. And as you said, just like the U.S. was not a big uh, protagonist of it, uh, the, it was easier to kill kill off the attention and so forth. But clearly, that's why both Putin and she accused the U.S. of sort of throwing this bomb into the into the information war. Um, thank you for coming to speak with us this evening. Um, with the murder of Saudi journalist Khashoggi being prominent right now and the rhetoric coming from the president, um, what are your thoughts on the state of the freedom of the press now versus when you started your career in journalism? Um, and have you ever felt your life was in danger because of the work that you do in Argentina? Well, just the first one, yeah, one time, which is not too much, you know, for somebody who works. Usually, I mean, 
I did I did a lot of um, I was a night cops reporter here during the murder epidemic in the early 90s. I went out and saw dead bodies almost every night, and many people thought that was heroic. But to be honest, you know, I I was never afraid to go to the northeast or or the southeast and and look at five ten bodies at the time. I don't know if, if any of you were Washington residents, the kids went to school and they had like nine millimeters, you know, printed in their shirts and, 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 and Mac 10s and so forth. And that was pretty, but I wasn't really afraid. Of once, yes, I was dealing with a mafia case and I got scared, but that was the only time. Uh, the other thing at Khashoggi, I'm really happy you asked because uh, Professor here, had also had in his question, and she kindly would demur because I talk so much. But I think uh, the case, obviously, uh, I mean, Trump's conduct is reprehensible. Also, he's such a liar when he says, like, China wanted this contract and Russia wanted this. I mean, it would have been more honest to say maybe France wanted it or Great Britain. I mean, Saudi Arabia has been a so strong ally of the U.S. and of, of Western uh, whatever for many, many years. And, and if they wouldn't give the contract to the U.S., they would surely give it to a U.S. ally. And, and I, I think Saudi Arabia is very far from falling into either China or Russia's fear of influences. Uh, on the contrary, is together with Israel and Egypt the main ally the U.S. has in the Middle East. So, and him saying like, "Oh, we don't know who did it," when when the, the the Turks have already made it very clear that they have strong evidence. What's interesting, and I was seeing some of the shows last night, is is what Turkey's how Turkey's playing. And again, it has a lot to do with journalism. <laughs> because they're not saying what they have, but they're filtering information, they're leaking information to especially the Turkish press, but also to the Washington Post. So it's like this drop by drop, you know, leak where everybody's asking or in the intelligence community or, or uh, international analysts is what does Turkey want, you know, and, and whether Turkey can roll back and say, okay, we got what we wanted, so okay, we never had any evidence, and, and Riyadh is free of any guilt and charge. I don't think that's going to happen. Again, like I said, what's really interesting about leaks is they, it's very, they're very hard to control once they start. So, and then uh, the other question is again, what they want? Is it something to do with Qatar? Is it something to do with, uh, well, you know, the pastor who came back, the strengthening of the, of the, of the Turkish coin. I mean, you have some uh, currency, you have so many variables there that it's just wait and see what happens. And then going into the journalism question, which was really a great question, and it was what we were talking with Alicia right before we came here. I think the paradigm has moved from fairness. When I started, like, everything had to be fair. That's the way I was trained as a journalist, check all sides. Also, the journalist is never the star. He's always behind the, behind the, the, his, his byline and so forth. I think the new paradigm is transparency. People care less and less about those of us who try to take as much uh, care as possible into being balanced, into checking uh, all sides, into getting people who think different than we do into our stories and giving them instead of trying to look for the stupidest argument the other guys make to ridicule it, try to find the most interesting and intelligent uh, argument people who think different from us have and so forth. So I think that's sort of being lost. And now people really care about uh, what, where, we're to where are we coming from? I, mean, I was just telling Alicia, even though she can, and we can try to be all neutral and very balanced and so forth, this is not the same chat you're going to have in Pat Robertson University, you know, in Georgia. Uh, the, the, every time now, there's more and more, you can see everybody's biases and where they're coming from. And I think the whole role of mediation in journalism has disappeared. You know, I think now we're like the friendly faces of different corporations who think differently, or we have our individual thought, which we we do it in our own individual communications. But I think that through the dual effects 
of media concentration and technological evolution. You know, media are becoming these great monsters that have too much to hide so that they can't really be revealing secrets from other places. And so people go directly to the source. If they want to know what Chrysler thinks, they no longer put on the TV show with some journalists talking about Chrysler. They go straight into their Chrysler uh, webpage, or they want to know what the Dallas Cowboys say, or they want to know, you know, what uh, Senator Doyle says, or what Judge Kavanaugh says. They just go straight to Kavanaugh, and straight to Dole, or straight to uh, Yahoo, or whatever. Uh, they want, and they don't need journalists to, so journalists less and less go out, and we have more and more curators and sort of synthesize all the big mass, and, and we have our own followers that more and more are leaving our media and are following us. You know, I think Paul Krugman has a lot more followers than the New York Times, because now every journalist or every person is his own chapel and with his own followers, and they take them to, to different media and different places. Uh, one thing about transparency, and I mean transparency in this sense, now that the world is more transparent now than before, I mean transparency in the sense that we're now living in an era where practically everything is known. Uh, a science shows was, uh, at some point that you can buy with $4 million every single phone call made in a medium country during 10 years. I mean, everything about you, about me, if somebody really wants to know, they will know. So we live in an era where there's practically no secrets. However, very few people have access to that huge information. Most of us have access to little bits and pieces of that great amount of information. So living in the era of transparency doesn't mean everybody knows everything about everybody. It means a very small amount of people know everything about all of us. And so that's what I mean by, so I think that the paradigm has moved through transparency. So what does that mean for us journalists or survivors of, I call it post-journalism. I think uh, the term doesn't define anything anymore because if we're all journalists, in the sense we all have access to blogs, to um, pages, to social media, we're on our own publishers, and so there is no real distinction that you can make, even though you're gonna say, of course, I don't know, uh, Bob Woodward is a journalist and my sister's not, but you know, in the middle there are a lot of categories that have become, the lines have become much more blurry. So what happens is that, like I spent 20 years never giving a, 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 an, a, an interview because I would say my, my place is behind the byline, my story speaks for itself. If, if, if I held out something in my story to give in my interview, then I'm cheating my newspaper. Uh, but if, if, if I put everything in my newspaper and I accept this radio interview, then I'm gonna be bullshitting, so I'm, so I'm cheating the radio, so I don't give any interviews. Now, think about that today, right? A journalist who doesn't give interviews, like the immediate reaction is not gonna be, oh, how noble, you know, how tradition, what a classic, you know, what a great example for journalists. No, it's gonna be, oh, he's got something to hide, right? So, like right now, I think like this year, my account is like, this is after 20 years of not giving an interview, I think I'm giving maybe two, three interviews a day. And, and now we're what, in October? I've probably done myself, I did one today, probably done less than five, or surely less than 10 interviews. So I'm losing 500 interviews to 10 in terms of being a, you know, a cheap celebrity, because it's not like I'm interviewed by, the greatest shows in the world, like some radio from some little province calls up or somebody, you know, and, and, uh, and uh, so, so it's like uh, I, I've gone from journalist to cheap celebrity, you know. So, uh. I think we have time for one more question. Well, thank you uh, for coming here and talking as well. Um, I had a question about kind of the age range of the most recent leakers are kind of in the millennial age. And I was wondering what you're asked, what you think, what you think in the future if leakers are gonna be treated a lot more, be a lot better um, 
in the next couple like generations that come up instead of being like imprisoned or seeking asylum? Well, one thing I learned is that there's a very fine line between journalism and terrorism, right? Your journalist is my terrorist. And basically, it did the same thing. We had this story, I never got into work, you know, I had this New, LA, uh, New York Times article that's really fascinating. It's just like a, a normal article that, that you could read almost any day, right? And, and it says like, basically what it says is that, is that, um, that somebody, somebody you know, came to this national security reporter to his attention that way back when Snowden was working for the CIA, one day he decided to like steal some information and they caught him, you know, and like, as if he were like a, a grade school toddler with a slap in the wrist, they sent him home for the day because like they didn't like what he did. Now, so imagine like the CIA who's stealing national security records, like, no, go for home for the day. Now, so the guy explains this and then he explains that he has six different sources, six, all right, count them, and among them there are military intelligence and oddly enough, legislative sources. So you're like, eh, legislative sources. Why would, why would a legislator have anything to do with it? Then you look down later in the story, and they say, like, well, actually, um, there's this law that should really pass that's really good, because you wouldn't have this problem of information falling through the cracks. You know? And so there's this law, you know, we could really vote for this law. And it's, it's really... Um, it's really funny because I don't know if we can look at the attribution there someplace. I, I don't mean to bother you, Alicia, at all, but no, okay. he doesn't really say that these six people have seen this report, supposed report, alleged report, where, but he says like they're in a position to know about this report, right? It's almost like he, they want to suggest that, they want to suggest that, that they've seen the report, but they don't really want to say it. So they say six people who are in a position, this, all this, right? So. The next day, uh, I don't know if you found that where it says the six sources. No, I'm looking. Okay. You can pretty go farther and I'll find it for you. Okay, it's, yeah, the beginning of like the second paragraph, or the third or fourth. Yeah, this is much, much higher up. Higher up? Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Now go down. Okay, there you Half go. A Half dozen. a dozen law enforcement, intelligence, and congressional officials with direct knowledge of the supervisor's report. All of the officials agreed to speak on the condition of anonymity because of continuing investigation, right? So we have six there. And bear in mind, this is all very secret information, right? I mean, this is stuff that, what would you call this if not a leak, right? They're leaking about a report from the CIA that's completely secret to sort of denounce a leaker, right? It's like, how can we have a leaker like Snowden when, you know, the only difference between this leak and Snowden's leak is this is a, a government authorized leak, so it's a good leak, but I mean, it, it boils down that like if, if you, your, your government likes to leak, then it's an, official, it's an official source or something nice. If the government doesn't like the leak, you have to be prosecuted and have spent 30 years in jail. So can you show me the next one, the next article? I'm sorry. So what's funny, the next day the CIA comes up and says, no way, man, of course, this document doesn't exist. This is a terrible lie. There is no document where we send Snowden home for spying, you know. This is a, you know, this is ridiculous. And the way this guy writes it, I mean, just leave it there, is because, first of all, six become two, right? There you go. Two of them, including one from the legislator who wanted, really wanted to pass a cool law against this happening, right? So the six go with the two, right? And this is really great because, like, down there he says, like, the CIA just flat out said this is a big lie. But I have these two guys 
who says, uh, and the next sentence to me is like to put it in a frame, right? Uh, this is like the biggest newspeak bullshit you'll ever see. And the reason I cite this, because this is the New York Times, this is the best paper in the world. These are the guys who really do their job well. But read that next section, with the next sentence, if you can, because I think it's such a funny sentence, right underneath the one you highlighted. Yeah. Asked repeatedly for comment over the past several weeks. Most recently on Thursday, the CIA declined. No, no, I'm sorry. I could keep going down. In the okay, keep going down. Okay, that's the one I love right there, right? He says, the two officials cited by the time said the CIA suspected. Now, the two officials, remember we had half a dozen. This is only 24 hours later. The two officials who was trying to get suspected now, all right, we're not sure, but they suspected that Mr. Snow was trying to get access to classified computer files he was not authorized to view. But other officials on Friday characterized the activity as much less serious, not involving potential security violations. It was unclear that why there was a divergence of opinion, you know. <laughs> That's the phrase I love. It's just like the CIA said, no way. It didn't happen. They didn't say it was less serious. And no, they said flat out the document didn't happen. I mean, I wish we had. There we go. The CIA did not file any report on Snowden indicating that it suspected he was trying to break in classified, having uh, authorized access. Blah. There's no way they're saying that he did something less serious. They're saying it didn't happen. <laughs> you know? And so it's unclear why there was a difference of opinion. It's very clear. If you look down, there's like some legislative guy who wants to pass a law, and he's, you know, he bashes Snowden so he can get some votes in the public opinion. So basically, just to end up answering your question, and thanks for letting us do this, it's like I think we're in a war right now. And these big, big players, nothing they do is um, geopolitically neutral. In this moment, both Assange and Snowden are seen as people who, like, like Snowden, he, he never revealed any secrets about US enemies. And, but since he's in Russia, right, whatever he tries to make his case, the public opinion is still going to think he's in Russia. I was telling his lawyer, because he said now he's just going to stay cool for a few years because he thinks that under Trump there's no debate possible that they did a huge campaign with celebrities, the ACLU, Human, uh, Human Rights Watch, and so forth. But I was arguing that I think that he's wrong. I think because what's he saying? He's saying the prosecutor and the judge are the U.S. government. The government is Trump and Jeff Sessions, and they're going to kill me, right? Which is what Ellsberg tells him and blah, blah, blah. But I think that even though he's right about the judge and the prosecutor, the jury is U.S. public opinion. And if he can change U.S. public opinion, I think that he has a good chance of winning in court. He's just got to change his perception amongst the American people. So I think that, that right now, if you want the, the... And remember, like, Obama prosecuted seven different... Uh, journalists for for treason under the, this this whistleblower uh, situation, uh, when previously only Tony Russo and Ellsberg, who are the Pentagon paper guys, had been prosecuted for treason. So right now, I would say the tide is pretty bad. But I think that forums like this and other kinds of activities can help turn er, turn it around. And and like uh, like his lawyer told me. Uh, and I think I said this already, that history tends to be kind to whistleblowers. Well, thank you for being here. Thank you, everyone.